Hello and welcome to our broadcast. I'm your host, Brett Barrow, founder and CEO of HerFeed. As a reminder, the information during this event is for educational purposes only. It is not intended, nor is it implied to be a substitute for professional medical advice. Always consult your healthcare provider to determine the appropriateness of the information for your own situation. If you have any questions regarding medical conditions or treatment plans, please consult your physician. Participating in this event with this clinician does not create a physician-patient relationship. Now that we have that out of the way, joining me today is Dr. Doug Cook, Chief Medical Officer, Physician Enterprise at Providence, Oregon. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Brett. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. So before we really delve into what we're going to discuss today, um, could you tell us a little bit more about or give us a little idea of what you do here at Providence? Yeah, absolutely. I'm the, the chief medical officer for the physician enterprise. That's the that's the portion of our organization that employs uh, physicians and uh, other licensed providers. So we're a big group now. I mean, across the system, it's uh, ten thousand providers. Wow. So uh, in a a short version, my job is to make sure that we're providing the best care for our patients and that it's the best place to practice healthcare for our providers. Um, Day to day, um, that means things like office efficiency and quality improvement and peer review and hiring the right doctors and um, I guess making sure that the physicians have the right tools and, and setting to really practice what I think most of our doctors consider their calling. So and that's a, a little bit about me. I, you know, I've worked for Providence for over 30 years, so I'm a, I'm a, a lifer for Providence. I, I love my work and I love Providence. Um, but I started my career in primary care, and it's still um, a big part of my day-to-day -day job is making sure our primary care doctors have what they need to deliver really good care. So I'm, I'm thrilled that you're interested in the topic and that we can talk about primary care today. Yeah, so I was just going to say, um, before we actually, can you tell us, for anybody who may not know, what is a primary care physician? Just to get that out of the way before we really delve more into this topic. Yeah, I mean, primary care, typically they're trained in, in family medicine or internal medicine. Uh, these are kind of your frontline providers. Uh, think back to uh, the Marcus Welby era. These are your general practitioners. Uh, they're the gateway to the uh, healthcare system. They manage more than 60% of, of various types of any problem you might see a doctor for can be managed in the primary care doctor's office. Um, they're your advocate. Uh, they help you organize your care. Um, so, yeah, that's that's primary care in a nutshell. So on that note, what would be why would somebody need a primary care physician versus just going and seeing a doctor when they get sick or something comes up? Yeah, I think the the simple answer might be that, um, you know, primary care doctors are going to focus on prevention and disease management. So so the whole objective here is to prevent those complications and worse medical conditions that could land you in the hospital. And, and that's what primary care is focused on is it's really that uh, preventing worse problems. So if, if you just wait until things fall apart, that's a strategy, I guess. But I think you're you're better off trying to address those needs up front. Um, but but even you know, I, let, let me back up one step, because I think even before that, um, you know, Providence has what we call our promise. It's know me, care for me, ease my way. You may have heard that before. Um, it's what we think most people want out of healthcare, care. Um, and it's really hard to deliver on that promise without a primary care doctor who really knows you, really knows all the various different medical concerns that you might have and can kind of piece together your care in a way that's seamless. Um, so in a big way, I think primary care is, is kind of our avenue to deliver on our promise. That makes a lot of sense. I, for me personally, I, uh, I've had, I've gone to the same primary care physician for years and I, there is such a, a reassurance in the back of my mind whenever anything comes up, I feel like I have an advocate, especially when it comes to certain things in the healthcare world that I, as kind of a layman or a laywoman, may not be able to speak to. So I feel like having a primary care physician is very helpful. Um, but on that note, for those who may not have a primary care physician, what would be the best way to get started? Well, I mean, um, 
I think you just want to call one of our offices and, and ask for an appointment is the, is the short version. But, but in addition, you know, we have our website and we have call centers that can help you navigate to the, the right provider. Uh, so our websites have information about the location of our practices. So you can find some place that's either close to your work or your home, um, has bios on our providers. Uh, we've got ratings that's sort of like you know, Yelp for physicians. Uh, so you can see what other people think of the provider, um, make sure that they're taking new patients for you. So I think that's a great place to start is, is to get into our website and, and uh, actually look around for a primary care provider that's at the location that, that would be best for each person. What Are there any health statistics for people who may have a primary care physician in comparison with those who don't? Yeah, there are, you know, there's a couple of national organizations that try and keep those statistics. Um, Primary Care Progress is a national organization uh, that tries to keep some of those statistics. So, um, yeah, so there's about 200,000 primary care providers in, in our country. That's about a fifth of the physician workforce. So you can kind of get a sense of there's a lot of doctors out there that are interested in doing this work, uh, but it always seems like there's not enough. Um, the um, the statistics that uh, primary care progress uh, quotes is that folks who have a primary care doctor versus just seeing whoever for which conditions um, that they have a 19 percent uh, lower risk of death from preventable illness things like heart attack stroke or cancer uh, that's a that's a big delta that uh, you can have by just establishing with a primary care doctor um, a fourth of emergency room visits can be managed by a primary care doctor, usually without having to wait in the emergency room and at a much lower cost. Um, I think I mentioned earlier that when you take all comer diagnoses, primary care doctors can manage a large majority of those. And we usually do so with better access and a lower cost. Um, in fact, it's, it's estimated that if everyone in our country had established with a primary care doctor and they used their primary care doctor as a first line, that we'd save $67 billion a year in the U.S. Um, so there's a big cost savings for our country there if we all organized our care that way. So I don't know. Those are a few of the numbers that stick in my head that, that, I, that I use when I'm talking. <laughs> um, what... Once you find a, a prime a, a recommendation, you find a, a primary physician that you want to go, you know, meet with for the first time. How should someone prepare? Oh, there's a couple of things I'd recommend. I mean, at first, I, you know, talking with the office, make sure the appointment's at the right length. Uh, that it's not just a, a short little brief appointment if it's a brand new or a complex problem. Um, so making sure you're scheduled for the right uh, amount of time. Uh, before you come, make sure if you've got several problems that you've prioritized those so that you know which, which things are most important so you, you cover those first. Um, it's always important to bring a list of your medicines and some of your past medical history so that you can uh, make sure that your provider knows that. Um, for folks that are hard of hearing or might have some memory problems, it's nice to bring somebody with you, a, a spouse or a son or a daughter, so that you can have sort of a, a second set of ears on, on some of the issues. Um, I think you know, the other thing that I, for people who haven't seen a primary care doctor, most primary care offices, um, they work in sort of a team-based environment. So expect when you come in that you're going to be working with a medical assistant or a nurse as well. They're going to do some of the information gathering and check your blood pressure and those sorts of things. Um, that throws off a few people when they think they're coming in to see the doctor. And it's like, well, I'm spending 10 minutes with these other people. What's what's that all about? But you know, again, it's just trying to be a, efficient with the time so that we can maximize the time the doctor has with the patient. That makes a lot of sense. Um, what are you? You mentioned before, you know, knowing your medications and, um, and you know, having a list of um, you know issues you want to discuss. But what are the types of things that are actually kept in a patient's medical record? So within a medical record, it's, I mean, there's a lot of information in there now. I mean, it, it has demographic information, insurance information. It's got a list of your current health problems, as well as your past surgeries, your past medical history, medications, uh, allergies, uh, family history. Um, all of our electronic medical records now, they also have 
you know, all the, your list of your previous lab results and x-rays. I mean, it's really an exhaustive file at this point. Um, so all those things go into the, the medical record today. I Personally, I'm, every time you go to a new doctor and having to, back in the day where you would have to fill out that paperwork, it would take, you know, you would add another 15 minutes to your appointment. So for me personally, I think having an electronic medical record has been, it's a time, it's for me, it's, it's saving time. So I personally appreciate it. Um, what, but, you know, I know that some, at times this has come up and people have questioned, like how, how is this information kept safe and confidential? Because obviously this is some very personal information that you may not want out you know, shared with anybody. So yeah. how, how is that managed? Yeah, it's really different today. You know, it used to be when people had a paper file, you'd just lock it in the file cabinet and the doctor would go home and it was pretty safe. Nobody could get in and see it. Yeah. But with these electronic records, um, it's a it's a big and very important task that all medical facilities are, are mindful of. Um, you know, back in, I think it was 1996, the the HIPAA Act, the Health Information Protection Act, was um, was passed. There were there were some more strengthening uh, done with that, and I think the first part, 2003, first part of this last decade. Um, but but it's that legislation that's really set up the framework to really keep your information safe and confidential, so that you know it, it provides a framework around what are the firewalls and encryption necessary. Um, two-factor authentication for a, a provider to get into that record, um, the, uh, all the policies that are necessary to say who can and can't view the medical record, as well as requirements for auditing that record. I mean, that is one of the, the safe things about electronic health records is there's sort of this electronic fingerprint. If anybody's touched that chart or opened it, we know it. Um, so we have a way of making sure that no one's getting into charts unnecessarily. It'll only be your provider, your care team. Um, so I, I feel pretty good ab about the safety of our electronic health records now. I also think that, you know, back in the day when you when it was a paper file, if you went to a specialist, for instance, then they would have to, you'd either have to get a copy of, you know, your medical records. And for me, back in the day, mine was pretty thick because I was always at my doctor's office in college. But, you know, you to ask for them, you either had to go there or they had to fax it over. There is, you know, this this is such a, I feel like it's so much more cohesive now and it's so much more, you know that the doctor that you're going to see is most likely going to get the right information. And to me, I feel like that's such a nice, you know, reassurance to have. Yeah, I think especially within what we call an integrated delivery system, where you've got a group of doctors that are practicing together and they're all on the same electronic health record, um, it's a huge time savings. And, you know, we're used to, like you said, have to copy and send all these files. So frequently the specialists say, gee, I haven't gotten your records yet. Well, now they just turn on the computer screen and it's all all there. In fact, I'd say, uh, you know, we even will do what we call e-consults where we're not sure if a patient should be seen by a specialist. And so we'll, you know, we'll type up uh, and cue in the specialist and say, hey, will you look at this x-ray with me? I don't know if I need this patient needs to be sent to you or not. So sometimes we can save the patient even a visit altogether because of that integrated electronic record. So a huge advance. That is, that's huge, especially when there's something going on and you as a patient wants to get an answer rather than feeling like you have to go, you know, from doctor to doctor to doctor, they, you, some of that legwork could be done for you. But you yeah. keep mentioning specialists. And we actually got a question from Facebook. Uh, do primary care physicians also take care of some specialist type needs? Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, primary care doctors will frequently sort of start the evaluation that may or may not end up in the hands of a, a specialist. Um, you have a little bit of blood in your urine. Well, gee, does uh, maybe we should check the urinalysis or maybe we need to check an ultrasound of the kidney. And the, the, the primary care doctor may find the answer, least is expected to do the preliminary evaluation. And then Maybe that patient does need to see a, a urologist, but um, but many fir first line interventions and, and evaluations are done in the primary care doctor office. Uh, that's actually really interesting to know. It's good to know too. Uh, we have another Facebook question. So, how, 
someone asked, I'm wondering how often should a healthy adult see their primary care doctor? Uh, it depends. How's that for a wishy-washy <laughs> answer? Uh, it depends on your age. It depends on your sex. Uh, it depends on your chronic medical conditions. Um, so when you, th you think about various cancer screenings, um, you know, we recommend women have regular pap smears and mammograms earlier in life. Men, you know, pretty user-friendly until you get to be about 50, and then they need to start regularly seeing their doctor. Um, uh, folks with uh, high blood pressure or diabetes may need to be seen several times a year, where if you don't have those things, you may not uh, need to, to be seen so regularly. So I, th I think the answer is it should be individually managed. You know, it's one of the things when, when we're establishing with a, a new patient in our, our primary care practices, we try and spend a fair amount of time understanding that patient's goals and their health care. So in that first appointment, spending a fair amount of time trying to figure out what makes you tick and, and what are you looking for out of, out of your health care, and then fine tuning a plan that's really built around that. Um, so we'll, we'll make recommendations for your colonoscopies or your cancer screening at the appropriate intervals based on national guidelines. But but we'll work with each individual to feel uh, like they have both control and we're being very centered on what they want. Would you say that for uh, if you were to say, you know, like, like women need to get their annual um, every year, they're supposed to get. Uh, would you say that a healthy adult, though, should try to visit a primary care physician once a year? or every other year? I mean, is is there sort of like a rule of thumb or does it just totally depend on the person? Oh, I, I, I think a rule of thumb you could use would be annually. I think it's it's very reasonable to at least be checking in with your provider every year. Um, that, that's probably a minimum spec. Uh, but uh, there are there are circumstances in, in sort of in your 20s and 30s where people may go a few years um, and it's probably okay. Uh, but certainly as you get into your 40s and 50s to think about annually, uh, getting in to see your primary care provider, a great idea. So actually on that note, would you also say that you would suggest that a healthy adult who may not have any, you know, illnesses or any, you know, any ailments or any, you know, any pre-existing health conditions, would you, would you suggest that most healthy adults should try to have a primary care physician that it would actually, even if they don't necessarily need this person, but I sort of feel like that's a lot of what we're saying here right now, but it, I mean, it sounds like it would make your, all of our, each individual's life a little bit easier um, having sort of that, that person. So yeah, I, well, absolutely. Um, I, I think it. Uh, you know, again, I don't. I don't want to be too presumptive, but but I think everybody could use a primary care doctor. I mean, think of them as your your advocate and your coach around healthcare, and you don't know what's going to come up. And and frequently, people, you know, they may not be aware that they have something that's brewing. That they're, you know, you can have elevated blood pressure and feel entirely fine and have no awareness of it. So, getting in regularly, establishing making sure you have somebody looking over your records and saying, gee, if you had your cholesterol checked or, or if you had your flu vaccine this year, are you up to date on your cancer screening activities? Um, and then also to ask the questions about just, you know, how's it going? How's the stress in your life? Um, are you, are you uh, following a healthy diet? Are you exercising regularly? Uh, I think having that regular check-in keeps people to task on the things that will keep them healthy. You sort of brought up um, a little bit ago about things that may arise. So this last year, we've all obviously had something that came up that wasn't exactly something that we all anticipated with COVID-19. So in terms of that, how is the process or has the process uh, for a routine checkup, has that changed because of since the onset of COVID-19? Yeah, I mean, COVID's changed all of our lives, right? So, and, and healthcare is is no different, or perhaps more so. You know, there were a few months in there from in March and April where there was actually government regulations that we we were asking people not to go out and seek elective or routine care, and people were just saying like, hold off for a few months till we understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, created a little bit of a backlog for some of those routine things, but but care today does look very different. Um, 
uh, you know, we screen all of our patients now, either by phone the night before or at the front desk to try and sort out people that might have any sort of COVID symptoms. And we, we sort of have two pathways in most of our offices and different types of evaluation so we can keep our, our sick patients and our well patients, if you will, separate a little bit. Um, the offices look different. Everybody's wearing a mask. We do universal masking. Uh, there's extra cleaning and disinfection that happens in our clinics. You'll see more hand washing uh, and glove wearing than perhaps maybe people are used to. Um, so it's, uh, it is it is very different now. Um, uh, that said, uh, we think it's really safe too. I mean, we've, we've done a lot of things to ensure the safety of our patients. Um, I've been to see my doctor in the last month. I feel very safe. I want other folks to feel safe too. So I think that's really important. I think that that's, you know, sort of top of mind is, you know, if you go to your doctor uh, for a routine checkup, is it going to be safe or are you putting yourself at risk? And I think that having that reassurance, knowing that there are all of these precautions being taken uh, definitely gives a lot of people peace of mind. Um, if a person needs to go to the ER, is their primary care physician alerted? Yeah, I, actually, many times it, it happens the other way around. Again, if you're in good contact with your primary care doctor and, and he's been evaluating you for some symptoms that get worse, it may be your primary care doctor that's calling the ER and saying, hey, Brett's coming to the ER. We want you to be ready to, to receive her and here's what's going on and this is what I'm concerned about. So sometimes the communication starts on the primary care doctor's end, but, but if not, uh, there's always communication back to the primary care doctor. Um, when it's more urgent, when someone's gonna end up staying in the hospital or needing to see a subspecialist. A lot of times they want to coordinate that with the primary care doctor, so they'll be on the phone with him. Um, at the time of discharge or when you leave the emergency room, uh, those become no notes in the electronic health record, so those go back to the, the primary care doctor too. So, I mean, that's one of the things, again, back to the electronic health record that is, it's really made that communication really good. Um, so uh, absolutely is the answer to that question. Sorry if I was long-winded. No, no, no. It, that was great. I feel like understanding that makes it a lot, you know, it's much, we'd, we'd all appreciate understanding this more than just hearing a yes or no. Um, if, uh, how, uh, you, you kind of already touched upon this, but how is the information with an electronic health record, how is that shared across different caregivers with, uh, within the health system? So you sort of touched upon it, but can you go into it a little bit more? Yeah, a little bit. I, I mean, I think the misconception people have is they still think about the paper chart, like it's gotta be sent around from one doctor to the next. And that's, and that's not really the way it works now, really. There's just, there's a single electronic record and people dial in and they view the same record. So you really have an integrated record. And, and, and so that's, that's how it's shared. You have within the sort of the, the server as your record and, people can dial in with the appropriate credentials uh, to look at it. And the advantage of that is everybody's on the same page. Uh, like, you know, I, it's not like I forgot to take a thorough medication history. So I've, I forgot that you're on these two medicines or that you have this allergy. We're all working together to make sure you have a single unified medical record that's accurate. So, so that's kind of how the sh sharing happens. Um, in terms of, uh, finding, going sort of back all the way to the beginning of this conversation, but in terms of if you don't have a primary care physician, you know, you did touch upon how you could find one. What would you say, you know, are important uh, characteristics that someone, you know, should look for in a primary care physician? For instance, the good bedside manner, is it the personality, is it, you know, what are some of the things I guess you would suggest somebody look for? Well, I'm, I'm biased because I, I think if they have provenance on their badge, they're going to be good. <laughs> we do a really good job of screening all the providers that we hire. Yeah. We don't hire anybody who doesn't bring both excellence in their clinical knowledge and a good bedside manner uh, to our care team. Uh, that's you know part of what we strive for day in, day out. Um, but yeah, but but beyond that, picking out a provider is um, it's hard because I mean you, there are personalities, and you want to make sure that you really you have good rapport because you're you're telling a primary care doctor very personal things. Um, so um, 
how, how do you how do you sort through that? Um, you know, some of that is uh, reading bios that we have and kind of saying, well, this you know gives a a little flavor for that person. Um, talking with friends and coworkers, you know, do they do they like their doctor? I still think word of mouth is a great way to to understand it. Um, um, I always used to tell people, uh, uh, ask ask a local nurse. A nurse is great, got great intel. You know, they're they're rubbing elbows with doctors all the time. They know who's got a good bedside manner and who's smart. So if you if you're lucky enough to have a friend who's a who's an RN, ask their opinion about who's a good doctor in your area. That's a that's a good way to pick someone out as well. Yeah, I I I think that's great advice because I do think that it is sort of you are telling them so much personal information. I do think that you. You know, as a patient, you want to obviously feel like the personalities gel well. And obviously, Providence has the best of the best. But just in terms of just being a normal person like me, if I were to go look for one, uh, what would you have recommended? But we are sort of getting towards the end. Um, in general, what do you think, what would you say people can do to remain in optimal health during flu season? Because that is approaching. Oh, great. I'm glad you asked the question. Um, yeah, I think a lot of us are concerned about flu season, about the you know potential combination of having flu in our, our communities and COVID is a, a pretty scary thought. So uh, far and away, uh, the most important thing to do is get a, a flu vaccine. Uh, get your flu shot. Um, uh, the flu shots are very safe. They're very effective at, at preventing influenza. Um, you know, some of the things that we're doing right now to prevent COVID, um, so wearing masks, frequent hand washing, staying away from people who are sick, staying home if you're sick, those sorts of things, mm -hmm. that's, that's probably going to help us have a lighter flu season. That's what everyone's sort of anticipating and kind of keeping their fingers crossed that that's going to be the case. Um, and then there's, you know, I'd be um, remiss if I didn't, you know, things like good diet, get your sleep, um, you know, rest uh, is, those are always important things, um, but far and away, get your flu shot. I think that I'm going to go get mine uh, next week, so. Perfect. I'm ready. <laughs> uh, we pretty much have. I've asked all the questions I have. So is there anything you want to add or is there anything else you want to say? Oh, I, um, mostly just thanks. I mean, thanks for the opportunity to talk about primary care. Um, you know, I, I will say this, uh, you know, we have something in healthcare we, we refer to frequently as the triple aim and the triple aim uh, meaning simultaneously having better health outcomes, a better patient experience and lower cost of healthcare. Um, and I firmly believe that primary care doctors are at the sharp point of uh, the knife around the triple aim, that with good primary care, that's our, our best shot at actually delivering on the triple aim. So, um, so if you don't have a primary care, uh, for those folks that are listening, please establish and get one. And, and if you do have a primary care doctor, the next time you see them say thank you. I, I, I tend to think of our primary care doctors as kind of the unsung heroes. Uh, they're not always in the limelight, but every day they're on the front lines taking care of patients. Um, so um, I really appreciate what our primary care doctors do. So I think yeah, I, I think that's a great sentiment. And I think that we all, especially during these times when, when our health is so front and center, it's so important to appreciate the, the, the people that are taking care of us, especially our primary care physician. But we are out of time. So thank you, Dr. Cook Cook, for joining us today and to everyone for listening and sending in your questions. If you are looking for medical advice, please visit providence.org and make sure to follow us on social media at Providence on Twitter and under Providence, Providence Health System on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Thank you so much, everyone, and bye. Bye.